is estimation centric. That is in statistical signal processing in very simple terms, given noisy observations, the aim is to estimate a signal and underlying parameters. Behavioral economics is decision centric. That is, it seeks to solve problems where one is trying to construct a useful model for how humans make decisions given measurements. So it's conceivable that if we were to put together a behavioral economics model for a human decision maker, together with statistical signal processing, one can in principle design the, mathematic, the mathematical formalism for a human sensor interface. And that is what this talk in, in really abstract terms is, is going to deal with. So this talk is two parts. The first part of the talk will be the majority of this talk, and that is going to deal with human decision models and sequential detection. So this is a big area, and, and in this talk, we're going to skip most of the detailed mathematics and just give you the conceptual ideas. And these ideas are going to revolve around how one can solve a basic detection theory problem, such as quickest change detection, when there are human decision makers in the loop. And the key idea is that we're going to use simple behavioral economics and psychology models, along with detection theory, to show that the resulting system has very unusual behavior. Then the second part of the talk, and, and likely we will run out of time in the second part of the talk, so it's going to be fairly, fairly short, is going to deal with large-scale social networks. So suppose we were to take lots of individual decision makers and hook them up into a social network. There are two questions we want to answer there. Both of these are motivated from a signal processing point of view. The first is how to efficiently sample the social network. So in principle, one cannot ask everybody on Facebook for their opinion about a particular fact. How can you efficiently sample a small population? And the second question we're gonna deal with is, can we construct sophisticated stochastic dynamic models for a social network which reveal specific types of sociological phenomena. And we're particularly interested in a sociological phenomena called the glass ceiling effect, where maybe a minority of nodes in a network assume positions of power and never allow the majority to assume those positions of power. How can one construct such models? So we're gonna talk about those very briefly due to time constraints. Most of this talk is gonna focus on part one. Okay, so we're on to part one now, which is human decision models and sequential detection. So the basic protocol we're gonna consider here, and this is for simplicity because of uh, the time constraints, we're gonna have a bunch of human decision makers acting sequentially. So the first human decision maker acts, records its decision. The second human decision maker looks at that decision makes its own decision and so on. So we have a sequence of human decision makers and that is conveniently modeled in economics as a Bayesian social learning model. So that's the first thing we're gonna discuss formally. Once we have this interacting human decision makers, we're Bikram, you've accidentally hit the mute button, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, thanks. Okay, yes, so, sorry, yeah. Okay. So, um, so in the second subsection of part one, we're gonna talk about if we were to hook up a detector, so like a quickest change detector to the system, how does that perform? And we're gonna show some fairly unusual behavior. Then we're gonna talk about two really sophisticated models. So if these humans were now modeled as an anticipatory decision maker, which is very widely studied today in behavioral economics, how does that affect the entire human sensor system? 
And finally, we're going to talk very briefly about a quantum decision model, which has become very popular in psychology. So those are the four slides we're basically going to have for part one. And the main idea there is that all of these methods, we have human decision makers interacting with a statistical change detection algorithm. So first, we're going to discuss the basic Bayesian social learning protocol, which gives us a mathematical formalism for how these human detect human decision makers interact. So here is the very simplistic setup. Suppose we were trying to estimate a random variable X, which took on one of capital X values, and we had some prior distribution pi zero on this. So we're doing it in a really simplistic way. So if we went back to classical Bayes rule, it's kind of fairly straightforward. Given a prior at time k minus one, which is the prior, if you like, the posterior of my state x, given the previous observations, I get a new observation yk. And we're going to call the observation time yk a particular agent. So we get an observation with some likelihood. And then we simply update the posterior, which is simply proportional to the product of the prior times the likelihood. And that's classical base rule. And this picture shows that to you conceptually. We have some underlying state X. We have an observation. The observation is used by agent one to compute its posterior pi one, which is a prior to agent two. It computes its posterior pi two and so on according to the system. So this is all very trivial. Now let's look at a slightly more sophisticated version of this, which is motivated by behavioral economics. So we're going to discuss the short social learning protocol. So again, we're interested in estimating an underlying state X with some prior belief pi zero. But the difference now is each agent makes a decision and we only know the probability of X given the previous decisions, not the previous observations. So this actually relates to some very interesting facts as we're gonna discuss now. So the protocol is as follows. Agent K makes an observation, YK, just like before, with some likelihood. Then the agent chooses an action to minimize the cost. So the agent, chooses an action A, assume the one to cap A possible actions, to minimize a conditional expectation of some cost. So C of X A, now we don't know X of course, because X is measured. So the best you can do is minimize the conditional expectation of this cost with respect to your most recent observation Y K and the prior belief you have, which is Pi K minus one. So that's the best you can do as a rational Bayesian decision maker. And you make this action AK. And now we have to discuss how does the belief update? So how does the public belief based on my action AK update? So what happens there is basically the next agent updates the posterior of X given A1 to AK. So you're going from X from A1 to AK minus one to X to A1 to AK via Bayes rule. But this Bayes rule is extremely unusual. And this is the beginning of this idea of social learning. So again, the posterior is the prior times the likelihood. But because this likelihood is based on an action and the action taken by the agent depends on the observation, there is indirect information about the observation given the action. And, and if you write down using this elementary total probability law, this is the likelihood. And you immediately notice something really strange in even this very strange setup, a very simple setup, that now the posterior is, of course, proportional to the prior times the likelihood, but the likelihood itself is a function of the prior, because P of AK, given the observation, depends on pi K minus one. In classical Bayes rule, the prior and the likelihood are independent parameters. Whereas in the social learning protocol, you see that the prior actually enters the likelihood as well. And moreover, because the action is an arg min of some expectation involving pi k minus one and y k, it implies that this is actually some nonlinear discontinuous function, 
And this relates to all kinds of really interesting stuff. So the first important theorem on this, which was a very, very famous result published in 1992, but amazingly, actually a very similar result was done by Tom Cover and Hellman in 1970 in information theory, but, but the main result is really 1992. And this is the main result, which is today kind of classical, but it's worthwhile stressing. So if I were to code this very simple protocol up in MATLAB, I will notice something really interesting. After a while, pi k will simply converge to a constant probability and stop evolving. In other words, this social learning protocol, which is Bayesian, eventually stops. It just stops, regardless of what observation you get. So in mathematical terms, agents eventually end up choosing the same action. So they form something called an information cascade or a herd, and social learning stops with probability one for a finite amount of time. Okay, So this is a really famous result. Um, this has been generalized to more sophisticated graph structures. In this setup, agents were acting sequentially. You can imagine a more sophisticated adjacency matrix and exactly the same kind of result would happen. So why is this really important? Well, it tells you that in a system where you have multiple agents who are learning from the decisions of other agents, eventually the protocol will always stop and agents will herd. It means that even rational Bayesian decision makers will completely ignore their personal observation YK and simply parrot the decision of the previous decision maker, forming what you call a herding behavior or an information cascade. A very famous example of this is was in 1995. Uh, two authors wrote a book and it was not selling very well. So they secretly bought 50,000 copies of their own book. It became a New York Times bestseller. And then people started buying the book because it was a New York Times bestseller. And that's an example of hurting in, in a social system. Um, essentially, people did, do not know who are the people who bought the books. They just see the action that a lot of books were sold. And so they heard and, and mimic the same kind of behavior. So herding is generic in any social system or any Bayesian system where you have, in some sense, a quantization of your belief. This is like a quantization. You're taking a maximum of some belief with respect to a finite number of possibilities and herding is generic in, in such problems. Okay, so that is the very straightforward idea of a Bayesian social learning protocol. So I wanna now take this basic protocol and now show you how by applying this to a quickest change detection problem, really interesting stuff starts to arise. So this is our first simplistic setup of a human sensor interface. So we have a sensor, an underlying state of nature which jump changes. So we want to detect the change. We have observations, we have a posterior, and then we have our social learning system taking local decisions. And we have a controller here trying to detect based on the decisions of the humans, has there been a change in the system? So in simple terms, a sensor along with a human are observing a state of nature. We are observing the decisions of the human. And as a controller, we want to decide, has the system changed? Has the system not changed? If the system has not changed, we continue taking measurements. If the system has changed, we stop. So this is a stopping time problem. It's actually a stopping time partially observed Markov decision process, but we don't want to go into the details, but I just want to show you conceptually why this has an extremely unusual structure. Uh, this problem is also motivated by some of the deeper ideas by uh, economists like Daniel Kahneman, who've looked at things like thinking fast and thinking slow, where the fast decisions are made individually by the local decision maker, and the slow decision as to continue or stop is made at a slower time scale. Another way of viewing this is how does a local decision maker like a human interact with a global decision maker deciding whether you should continue to take measurements or not. So it's the interaction of two optimizers, a myopic human decision maker and a sophisticated controller. Okay, so let's go into the quickest change detection version of this, of this human sensor interface. So first, very quickly, the classical quickest detection problem has been known for almost 60 years. 
And the problem is this. I have a bunch of observations. Until some unknown random time tau zero, the observations have a distribution B1. After the random time tau zero, they have a distribution B2. Tau zero is called the change time. It's unknown to the observer. And in a Bayesian setup, it has some prior, which is a geometric prior. Okay. The aim of a detection algorithm is to detect the change time. So tau is an estimate of tau zero. And you're trying to find tau so as to minimize the following cost function. So if we wait for a very long time, then of course we can detect a change, but then we pay a delay penalty. So tau minus tau zero plus is equal to zero when tau is less than tau zero. And it's equal to tau minus tau zero when tau is greater than tau zero. So this is a delay penalty. And if I decide the system has changed before it actually changed, then I pay a false alarm penalty. So this is a classical trade-off between delay and decision-making. Now, this problem has been studied extremely well. And it is known that the optimal strategy, this was done by Shiriyev in the 1950s, has a threshold policy. So if your horizontal axis is the posterior probability of change and your vertical axis is the decision you're gonna decide as the system has changed or not, then you compute the probability of change given your observations of time k, where k increments over time, so that's your belief. If pi k becomes sufficiently large, you say the system has changed. If it's less than a particular value, the system has not changed. And this is the optimal policy. It's fairly easy to demonstrate this using dynamic programming. So this is well known. So now let's take a slight twist on this problem setup. What happens if we replace classical Bayesian update by our social learning protocol, which we discussed on the previous page? So now our belief is the probability of change given the previous decisions of the human decision makers. So instead of y1 to yk minus one, we have a1 to ak minus one. And we have a social learning protocol ahead of the previous page. The agent makes an observation and then makes its decision. And based on these decisions of the humans at time one, time two, time three, the global quickest detector needs to decide has there been a change or not. Now, keep in mind again, as I'm repeating here, our belief update, of course, evolves like this which is like the prior times the likelihood. And again, I just point out that the likelihood depends on the prior here, which results in some pretty interesting behavior. So the question is, given this public belief pi k, what is the optimal strategy of this global decision maker by looking at the decisions of the individual humans acting sequentially? And the answer is kind of quite stunning. The optimal policy has this multi-threshold structure which is very counterintuitive. This is counterintuitive because what this is saying is as the probability of change becomes large, I decide there's a change, which makes sense. But as the probability of change becomes even larger, I decide there is no change. So if, the moment you have a multi-threshold behavior, it's kind of philosophically really strange in the sense the higher the probability of a change, Actually, it's optimal to say there's no change in some regions. So this is really a manifestation of the nonlinear discontinuous Bayesian belief update in, in social learning, which manifests itself into non-convex stopping time. So essentially the stopping regions here now are disconnected. There's one region here and one region here. And this is actually typical in such problems which involve Bayesian decision makers that are acting. So this is a very unusual stopping time policy. And so the main result is the optimal policy is multi-threshold. The stopping set is non-convex. And what this means is that global decision maker using local decisions is actually non-trivial. It's not simply a threshold policy. It has multiple jumps. Actually, this sort of non-convexity has been studied in other contexts. So Sid Siklis in the 1980s studied this sort of problem in team decision theory problems. Okay, so this is our first kind of simplistic setup to show you that a human interacting with a decision maker results in actually pretty complex behavior. If you're dealing in a bureaucracy social network, what this is saying is that if I have a bunch of decision makers at a lower level 
and I'm looking at the decision sequentially, and I'm at a higher level trying to use those decisions to decide if a system has changed or not, that is highly non-trivial because the optimal policy is irregular. Okay, given that basic setup, so we've dis discussed now the basic social learning protocol. We have very briefly discussed how to perform multi-agent quickest change detection with these multiple humans. Now we want to introduce some more sophisticated behavioral economics and psychology models. So the main idea so far on the previous page is that the human decision maker makes a decision based on optimizing its utility function and a belief. But it is well known in behavioral economics and psychology that humans are not one stage expected utility maximizers. There are numerous studies showing that humans are much more complex in the decision making. So here I wanna study two really important models. The first is anticipatory models for human decision-making. So now each human here is not gonna solve just an expected utility, but each human here is gonna solve an anticipatory decision-making problem. So what is anticipatory decision-making? In simple terms, it says humans freak out. That is when humans make a decision now, the decision now depends on the probability of future decisions. So therefore, human decision-making can be modeled as a multi-stage model, not a one-stage expected utility. And the fact that your current decision depends on the probability of future decisions makes this problem time inconsistent. What this means is that the problem cannot be solved via dynamic programming. One has to interpret this as the Bayesian-Nash equilibrium of a multi-stage optimization problem. So these have been studied extremely well in behavioral economics, and they match numerous experimental studies. So I want to discuss first the anticipatory model. I want to give a little bit of mathematics to this. And then I want to discuss a second sophisticated model, which comes from psychology, that humans interpret probabilities so when we talk about expectations, there are probabilities. Humans interpret probabilities in particularly strange ways. One, the total probability rule does not hold. So, that, so it's called the violation of the sure thing principle. And two, there are other interesting effects in the way humans decide on subjective probability in the sense that the order effect. So in classical probability, P of A and B is the same as P of B and A, it's commutative. Whereas for humans, if you see A followed by B, you react differently compared to B followed by A. And it turns out that in psychology, some of these quantum decision models can model that extremely efficiently. So we're gonna discuss these very briefly now. So first, the anticipatory decision model. So there is enormous evidence in psychology and behavioral economics for this. So one, one really simple example to keep in mind in this example is the following, that it's been known that if, if you have the choice between having a painful electric shock today compared to a less painful electric shock tomorrow, most humans would choose having a painful electric shock today. Humans do not want to wait for bad news because that is anticipatory decision-making. You freak out about the future. Unfortunately, this makes the mathematics really, really difficult because this introduces time inconsistency. It also gives you some really interesting mathematics in terms of optimality. You can show using these anticipatory models that less information is better than more information. And this has also been studied. For example, um, if a surgeon were to tell you how they were gonna do the heart surgery, that they're gonna kind of cut into your chest cavity and rip open parts of your heart, Many people may just not want to do the surgery, even though that might be the optimal decision. There's also the famous planning fallacy of Daniel Kahneman in behavioral economics, which follows from anticipatory decision-making, that people underestimate the time to complete a task. So what is the basic idea here? The idea is this, that suppose we have some sort of physical state, and we're just doing a two-stage model here, with some transition kernel. So this is a two-stage model, uh, S1 and S2, and S2 simply evolves based on S1. It's based on some Markovian model. 
And now I make two decisions at time one, I make a decision based on my state S1. At time two, I make a decision based on my state S2 and my action A1. This is all very classical, but here comes the really important part. So in my decision-making as a human, I have a psychological or anxiety state, which is called ZK. So the Z1 and Z2. So Z1 is the unusual state. You see, it's telling you that your psychological state at time one depends on your action at time one. This is all very nice, but the unusual fact is it depends on the probability of you choosing a decision at time two based on your decisions at time one, okay? And your psychological state at time two is simply after the outcome A2 has happened, you see the state S2, so this is standard. And your aim now as a human decision maker is to optimize this two-stage problem. So this is different to social learning, which I did on the previous two slides, where I was simply optimizing a one-stage process. Now I'm optimizing a two-stage process. And this is a non-standard control problem because at stage one, my psychological state involves the probability of making a decision at time two. These are called time inconsistent problems and they cannot be solved using Bellman's equation. These are being studied in great detail in psychology, behavioral economics, and also in math finance. Essentially what happens here in simple terms is classical dynamic programming goes backwards in time. You first solve mu two, and then based on mu two, you solve mu one. Well, it turns out here because my decision at time one depends on probabilities at time two, mu two depends on mu one and mu one depends on mu two. So there's no easy way to break the tie of the two guys depending on each other. And so what you can do is use something called the extended Bellman equation, which solves this problem in terms of a perfect Bayesian Nash equilibrium. I'm not gonna go into the details of this because it's counterproductive here, but I just wanna say a couple of things. In this rational, rationalization of the subperfect perfect Nash equilibrium, you have some really unusual policies such as it's optimal to stick your head in the sand and simply get less information to make a better decision. So this kind of can justify a lot of really interesting behavioral economics experiments such as less information is better to make an optimal decision. One interesting problem then is, so we take now these individual agents, which are humans who are now anticipatory decision makers. And we can solve a very interesting change detection problem, which is related to an Airbnb problem as to why do people sometimes decide not to take a particular accommodation and switch to book other types of accommodation? Is that due to the fact that suddenly a particular type of accommodations quality has gone down or is it due to the existence of a new competitor? And you can model that very nicely using these techniques if you have an anticipatory human decision maker who at step one puts a deposit to, to reserve a particular accommodation, at time two may pull out and lose the deposit. So given these decisions and you as a quickest detector, how do you decide if there's been a change? And again, one can show that one has this kind of multi-threshold optimal policy, which is very unusual. And this is because you have these humans interacting, even though they are anticipatory decision makers. Okay, so that's the first model I wanted to talk about. I wanna very briefly talk about a second sophisticated model for human decision making, which is a quantum decision black box model. So um, this is purely a black box model in the sense that you're using the quantum probabilities just to come up with a decision rule. So one doesn't really need to know quantum mechanics in any detail to understand this. So the best way of understanding this, it's, it's a very parsimonious generative model for human decision-making. Uh, and it allows you to do two really important things. Firstly, it allows you to, to make decisions which violate the total probability law, which humans do. So the total probability law is simply telling you that if you had a posterior eta and you had the clean state E1 and E2, then your posterior probability is always a convex combination of the two clean states. That's the classical total probability law. But when humans make decisions, this does not hold. Okay, so a psychological study of this has been done, for example, in the prisoner's dilemma. 
the probability, if you take human subjects of defecting if the opponent defects is 0.91, the probability of defecting the opponent cooperates is 0.84. So therefore, if, if classical probability laws hold, then the probability of defecting given that you have an unknown opponent choice would be somewhere between 0.91 and 0.84. But yet you can show it actually typically is 0.6. It lies outside this region. Well, you can model this very efficiently using quantum probability ideas. I'm not going into the details here, but in very simple terms, what you do is you embed quantum probability into a Hilbert space, which is a vector space, and then you essentially come up with a stationary measure of a random walk on a quantum probability surface. Eventually, it simply gives you a black box that my decisions by the humans are a probability which depends on my prior parameterized by two important parameters. And that's why this is a very parsimonious model, a very efficient model. Alpha here is a rationality parameter of the human and lambda is a bounded rationality parameter. With this really simple model, you can now study again, quickest change detection. You have a bunch of humans observing a state, making decisions. How does the quickest detector make a decision based on these human decisions if something has changed? So our paper in 2022 does this in great detail. One in interesting thing is you can actually now rank how good are these individual humans for performing quickest detection because you can model humans purely by two parameters, their rationality parameter and their bounded rationality parameter, which is actually really an interesting way of comparing human decision makers. Okay, so those are, I mean, we're rapidly running out of time. So I want to make a few more remarks on part one and then just maybe very briefly say a few things on part two. So, so far we've discussed some basic ideas in human decision-making with detections. Now, as we mentioned, humans are not utility maximizers. So this idea we proposed of anticipatory decision-making is actually a special case of a much more general theory called coherent risk optimization. So in our social learning protocol, we said that humans were optimizing a utility, which is an expectation. Well, risk measures are a generalization of expectation where R here is a sub-additive operator. Expectation is an additive operator. The expectation of X plus Y is expectation of X plus expectation of Y. A risk is a sub-additive operator. It's much more general. And in many financial problems, you can use risk measures to model human decision makers, such as, for example, CBAR, which is called conditional value at risk. And then you notice some really unusual behavior. For example, the more risk averse humans become, so as a risk averse parameter goes up, the more humans herd onto safe decisions. And, and this is kind of uh, very intuitive. The second behavioral economics idea, which I want to quickly mention, which was some of the work of the Nobel laureate Christopher Sims, is rational inattention. So when humans make a measurement of a state, the idea of rational inattention due to Christopher Sims is that they're translating data into a decision by a finite Shannon capacity to process information. In other words, you're giving an information theoretic measure to human attention. So to give you a very basic idea here, in the classical utility maximization, when maximi minimizing some expected cost given my observation and a decision, now we're saying that if I pay a lot of attention to the state, I get a more accurate measurement, but that costs me more money. So there is a monetary effect. So this is the, the rational inattention term. See, if my observation is more accurate, then my posterior is very different to my prior, Therefore, the entropy of my prior minus the entropy of posterior is going to be very large because these two guys are very different. So I'm paying more money for more attention. If I pay no attention, in other words, my observation is completely useless, then my mutual information is zero because the Bayesian update is exactly the same as the prior and I pay no money. So this is giving you a kind of monetary value to human attention spans. And this is, again, another thing which is incorporated into, for example, quick exchange detection. The third point I want to mention is, of course, in what we've spoken about here in quick exchange detection, we've looked at, for example, anticipatory decision makers. 
acting sequentially over time. So first uh, one decision maker acts, then the next decision maker and so on. Suppose you could choose the order in which decision makers acted, in which order would they act? So you might have a high reputation individual, a good reputation, a low reputation, somebody with no reputation. If these were sensors, it's obvious you would first pick the highest signal to noise ratio sensor, then the next signal to noise ratio and so on. But notice that these are human decision makers. If the highest decision maker speaks first, it affects, influences the decisions of lower decision makers. So um, you cannot have the senior most person speak first because that would adversely affect the junior agents. So the seniority rule is clearly not optimal. What would be the optimal rule when each one of these are anticipatory decision makers? You are an anticipatory decision maker. You know when you make your decision, then maybe a more famous person after you is going to judge your decision. So what are you going to say? Well, in the U.S. Supreme Court, for example, they use the anti-seniority law. That is typically the junior most judge speaks first, followed by other judges. Okay, so that is all I want to say in part one. I believe this seminar is 45 minutes. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay, so I have about five minutes. In the last five minutes, I just want to say very brief things about part two because we're out of time. So in part one, we spoke about human decision makers interacting in a very stylized, specific environment using behavioral economics models. In part two, we want to now take human decision makers in a large social network, such as Facebook or Twitter, and we want to look at two things. How do I sample a social network? How do I construct a useful model for certain sociological effects? I want to just talk about the sampling part due to lack of time. So the sampling part is really important because if I have a large social network and I'm trying to, for example, determine who's going to win an election, you have two parties, red and blue, I can't possibly ask everybody in the social network if there are a billion people. That's impossible. So I can only poll a few people. How do I poll them? What questions do I ask them? This is also important in marketing surveys and also in the spread of disease. If you can poll specific people, then you can actually track a disease very effectively. So the most well-known example of polling is intent polling. You go to a bunch of individuals you've chosen and ask them, who will you vote for? That's the voting intention. Well, intent polling is unbiased, but it has a very large variance. And that's why almost always it's been inaccurate, particularly in predicting US uh, presidential elections. It's been wrong in many times. A much more sophisticated polling, which was proposed by my colleague David Rothschild at Microsoft Research, is expectation polling. They asked the question, who will win? So you go and ask individuals, not who you're going to vote for, but ask them, who do you think is going to win? Well, the logic there is the individual is going to take their own polling into account their own voting intention together with their friends. And so maybe they're taking a larger sample. And so it might be more accurate. So this is going to be a lower variance, but it turns out it could be biased. So actually Rothschild shows that in the US presidential elections from 1952 to 2008, expectation polling was much more accurate than intent polling every time. But it's not always true. It depends on the structure of the social network. If there's one red guy with a bunch of blue guys, then Every blue guy is going to have the red guy as a friend. And so expectation polling will be half because you're going to count, each blue guy is going to count the red guy as a friend. And so who are you going to win? Well, you, the blue guy is going to say, this red guy thinks the red is going to win. I think the blue is going to win. And so it's going to bias. You're going to measure this red guy a lot of times. Can you do something more sophisticated? So some work we have done recently, which has been published uh, in Nature Communications 2020, this is work with my PhD student and also uh, a colleague at University of Southern California, is we use something called the friendship paradox. So the friendship paradox is a very powerful result. It's, it's a consequence of random graphs. And it tells you the following. Typically, your friends are more friends than you do. What it means is the following. I'm just going to say this, and then I'll stop for today. Suppose you have a graph, and you can do three possibilities. You can pick from the graph with uniform distribution, a specific node, okay? And we can count for that node, the number of its neighbors, okay? So you can say, I pick a node, I look at how many neighbors, and I can say how good the node is giving me the idea of who's gonna win the election. I can do a second thing. I can pick a random link, and then from the link, I pick a node, and then I query that node. 
it's obvious that if I pick a random link, since on average, a link points to a more popular node, if I pick a random link, the probability of picking a more highly connected node is much higher. This is shown in this picture here. If I pick a random link, three out of four links point to Bob. So if I pick a random link, the probability of picking a more connected individual is much higher. And essentially the friendship paradox is basically saying that, that the expected number of neighbors of Y likelihood ratio dominates number of expected numbers of X. In other words, Y is always more accurate than X. So by using the friendship paradox, it turns out you can do a very sophisticated form of polling where you ask two things. You choose a random friend of a sample node, and then you ask the question, what fraction of your friends will vote for candidate one? And this is a very powerful way because people are often reluctant to say who they're gonna vote personally, but they're perfectly happy to say what fraction of their friends are gonna vote for a particular candidate. So this actually gets rid of the social desirability bias and yet it gives you an extremely powerful estimator. And, and these are some examples we've done on Facebook and also co-authorship networks showing that the variance of these are substantially smaller than the classical intent polling and expectation polling. So this is the, the friendship paradox based polling. And, and you can actually come up with sophisticated bounds mathematically to prove all these things. Okay, that's all I wanna say. If time was there, I would have given a second example of how you can model the glass ceiling effect and structural inequalities in social networks. But since we're out of time, I just wanna to go to the summary of this talk. Um, so we've discussed really two parts, well, primarily part one, which is really the interaction of behavioral economics with signal processing and control. Uh, primarily here, we did a very simple example of social learning and quickest detection and the decision models are from behavioral economics and psychology. And I very briefly spoke about how you can pull large scale social networks using things like the friendship paradox. In a really big picture idea, there's a lot of synergy between signal processing and sort of behavioral economics. It, we have statistical, statistical signal processing with data, physical sensors and sensor networks. The analog in, in more higher levels of behavioral economics is Statistics signal processing is replaced by behavioral, behavioral economics. Physical sensors replaced by social sensors, like humans inputting decisions, and a sensor network with a social network. And we've given you a highly simplified presentation here. There's actually a lot more which one can say, uh, but that's all I want to say here. Thank you very much. Happy to answer any questions. Thanks for a fa fascinating talk there, Vikram. Um, while we're waiting for other questions, I've got two, two general questions for you, Vikram. Go ahead. Um, I, I think it's true that people often prefer what they know, even if bad, and also normally, normally people don't think, they just listen to who they trust. And so maybe you need to identify key people. So, so how, how, how is this taken into account with the mathematics or, or don't you need to take it into account, it just comes out? Well, absolutely. So social influence is automatically part of herding behavior. So in social influence, and I guess what you're saying is, can this influence social decision maker affect this person? That can be studied very nicely. There is actually two ways of answering that. One is it's already manifest in this herding behavior. You see, the point here is saying that if multiple individuals have made a decision already, then you as the next individual are swayed by the decisions of previous individuals. In this setup, we've assumed that everybody has the same cost. Now, if somebody has a larger cost, that would have a larger impact on the next decision maker. So you can automatically model this in a social learning framework, but you can also model this using other types of models of social influence, which, which I can discuss mm -hmm. offline, which are more sophisticated than these. But regardless of that, in both these cases, the moment you put things like anticipatory decision-making, interesting things start appearing because you are trying to predict future outcomes while you're making your current decision. Mm -hmm. Great. And my second general question is how would this apply to investment decisions? How to invest in the stock market? And can you use the fact that people have this herd behavior to try to predict share prices? 
That's an excellent question. So this appears in two ways, and we've done a lot of work on this over the years. Um, so uh, one thing I didn't mention, in terms of references, if you go to my webpage, there's a lot of papers in these. So there are two ways I can answer this. One, this sort of system arises in automated trading, high frequency trading the stock market. So these would be computers looking at the reputation of certain companies. So if I notice that company one, which is a very well reputed company is doing automated trading and for example, buying large amounts of the Euro, mm -hmm. I would mimic that. So I'm doing mm -hmm. a social learning because I think this is a high reputation company. So that mm -hmm. happens all the time and therefore devising strategies and automated trading is inherently subject to this type of herding or information cascade. Now mm. with human decision makers, this is the original reason why these models came up. The idea of herding is why suddenly you have mass panic sell-offs in the, in the share market. So you have mm. individuals who say, oh, all these guys are selling, therefore I need to sell and exit the market. But mm. as I mentioned, you can make this much more sophisticated by applying anticipatory decision making for that and applying coherent risk measures. So in the finance industry, CBAR is now almost a bread and butter tool for modeling decision makers. Mm -hmm. So this is a risk averse way of making decisions. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Vikram. Uh, Xiang Rong, have we got any questions from other people at this stage? Yeah, yeah we got one question from uh, Wei Tong Jai. So I'm going to argue him and ask him to ask. Where is he? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I just can't. Yeah, where is it? Oh, let me find him. Okay. Uh, hello, Professor. Hi. Uh, uh, your talks and your discussion, what's the difference between it and the machine learning uh, decision makers, such as the deep learning or reinforcement learning and so on? And can the machine learning approaches now uh, learn from the human makers that so as to solve some more complex uh, problems? That's an excellent question. So the question is, how do you relate some of these models to machine learning, like deep learning type models? In some sense, these are kind of the exact opposite. So deep learning tends to do the following. I want a complete complex black, black box model for certain phenomena. The idea in behavioral economics and psychology is to say, I want the simplest, most parsimonious model for a human decision maker. So in some sense, these are polarized opposites. One is trying to make a really simple parsimonious model which explains why a human made a particular decision. And I should point this out, although I didn't mention my talk. Of course, a human is not solving quantum mechanics to make a decision, or a human is not computing a Nash equilibrium to make an anticipatory decision. These are simple models which explain a human decision maker. You see, this is the difference. So this is a generative model. We have a model which explains human decision-making. Machine learning is post-mortem. I have data and from the data, I learn a really complicated neural network model. So in a sense, these are two polar opposites. There is a lot of scope, I guess, to go in between to kind of say, for example, if there was a human interacting with a machine learning device, how would you model the overall thing? And that would be one way of looking at this. So for example, the measurement could be from a deep learning sensor, which is looking at videos and identifying certain things. Then a human is trying to make a decision based on that. The human is an anticipatory decision maker. How do you model the overall thing? And that would be an excellent area of research for sure. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. so. Um, I got I got one question. So, so all these model, for example, like the Bayesian models, did you get this model from the real real data? So, like, um, did you get this real? Where, where did you get this real data from? Like Facebook or Twitter? So, right. just... so these have been studied experimentally by numerous people. So, uh, for example, the model of the anticipatory decision maker is studied by Kaplan and Lee, and this is a very famous paper. This was used by Jean Tirol, who won the Nobel Prize in economics to come up with something called mindful economics. So this is one of the most famous models in economics. Mm 
And even most recently, Brunemer at Princeton has come up with more general versions of this model. So anticipatory decision models are widely used in economics, um, and there's a lot of experimental studies. The next model is quantum black box models. These are today extremely famous in psychology. So people have done experiments to show, for example, that humans violate the total probability law. Humans have order effects. That is a probability of A and B is not the same as probably B and A. And for example, rational inattention was proposed by Christopher Sims, who won the Nobel Prize in economics four years ago, coming up with ideas of how you model human attention spans in decision making. So these ideas are very well known. Uh, coherent risk measures, I mean, if you Google up Rockefeller and Eurocept, this is one of the most famous papers written in, in economics in the last 20 years. And this is widely used today by financial investors. CVAR is kind of the most standard tool. So most of these methods are kind of simple tools which model complex phenomena. This is the opposite of machine learning where you have a complex model trying to kind of fit data. This is kind of the exact opposite in, in some sense. Okay, thank you. So Jonathan, I think there are no more questions now. Can we call it end today? I think- Okay, no worries. Vikram, it was a pleasure as always, an extremely clear talk and very educational. Um, I'll certainly be in touch over email, and I'm sure you'd welcome others to contact you too sure. if you have things. So thank you, everyone. It's way past midnight here, so I'll say good night from my end, but good morning for Vikram, and see you next time. Take care. See you. Thank, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Vikram. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.